This is Mike Brewer behind the wheel. Automotive news, automotive advice, and tyre smoking fun. Join me, the Brit with the wit, and my car-loving co-host, Brad Fanshawe. Hello everyone, it's Mike Brewer behind the wheel, and I'm looking forward to taking you on a journey of motoring, expertise, fun, facts, and all the stuff that we embrace ourselves with, this wonderful hobby that we love, the classic car and motoring world. Uh, now, together... We are going to go down this journey, but the man who always grabs the passenger door, and I do like travelling with him because he's always got the best snacks, he always shouts, shotgun, whenever I'm hitting the road, is my passenger, and he seems very willing. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brad Fanshawe. Hey, Mike, how you doing? I'm all right, Brad, yeah, ready for the journey? I am. I'm always looking forward to these because you take us to the best places. Anyway, let's hit the road. Let's go. Hello everyone, it's Mike Brewer behind the wheel. Uh, very, very pleased to be talking to you again. I'm just walking over to the car. Let me let me just get the door and open it up. Now, I just need to walk around the other side and open up the passenger door for my passenger, who always called shotgun and wants to slide into that passenger seat. Mr. Brad Fanshawe, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just so happy that we're three episodes in and you're still opening the door for me. Uh, well, I have to, old man. You know how it works. You know how it works. <laughs> well, now, I, it's the day that you lock me out that you push down on the lock come, and I'm sh- like, sh- sit down. Do you need help with your seatbelt? <laughs> I can reach across and put your seatbelt on if you like. I think you can manage that. Here you go. You clipped yourself in. I've got it. I get, let me it. tighten it up a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, there you go. Right, there we, we just go. clip ourselves in. As we slide into gear and we take on this, uh, this journey, let's tell you what's been happening in motoring this week. It's been a Really exciting, uh, really exciting week uh, because uh, car shows not only are kicking off now, we're getting into that season of uh, uh, car shows kicking off all across the world in terms of indoor car shows for the likes of uh, uh, fans and consumers. Uh, But now we've got the manufacturers showcasing what is going to be great and what is coming up in the future. And the one that kicks that off every year uh, for me is, the I think, the best car show of the year for manufacturers is the Geneva Motor Show. I love that place. Oh, Geneva. It's like, first of all, the setting's fantastic, but then it's always spectacular launches. I have got so many Geneva stories. (laughs) <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> can you can, tell them? Uh, we, can, we can tell all of them, but we would be here for a very, very long time. But I'm going to cut to the chase because uh, Geneva Motor Show uh, sits at the foot of the Evian Mountains, uh, which is where the water comes from. You've got Lake Geneva, absolutely beautiful, and they've got this huge exhibition centre. And it's perfect because they put the exhibition centre right next to the airport. They literally, the two buildings join each other. So you can fly in, do the motor show, and fly out. And they make the show. Not one of these vast Frankfurt Motor Show affairs that, you know, is eight miles from one hall to the other hall. It's just a small condensed show that all the manufacturers want to showcase their best. I've been every year for the past 15 years, and this is the first year I've had to do it online. And I've been jealous that you've been there every year. Ski. I ski there. Because oh. because it's where they put the show. They put the show right next to the mountains. Uh, so you've got uh, Mont Blanc. You've got Ma- the yes. Mont Blanc mountain range right on your doorstep. So you fly in and ski. Absolutely fantastic. Right now in this car, me and you, we would be driving along. And I'd have my skis on the roof. We'd have our salopettes in the back. And me and you are going to be on our way to go and uh, smash some snow before we go and look at some cars. Now, would they let me snowboard? Yeah, you can snowboard. It's um, it's quite French now to snowboard. It's quite nice. For a while, it was hey, don't bring no, your no, snowboard. No, 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 no. But you, now it's very popular. They all they all want the snowboards there now. So uh, Geneva Motor Show uh, is a place for manufacturers to showcase their wares. Uh, everyone. Almost everyone seemed to have something uh, they wanted to show off. But let's go for the fanfare items, OK? Were well, there any British cars that debuted yeah, there? Yeah, there, <laughs> there was quite a few British cars that debuted there. But one of them, uh, it, it was a was a big launch, you know, a uh, huge launch. Everyone's been waiting for this. Um, but let's bring it, let's go uh, for why everyone's waiting for this. All right. So, so the king of the electric car market at the moment is the guy that's sending stuff into space, Mr Elon Musk, and the Tesla car company there is no doubt about it that is the king of the electric car globally you know what i find amazing about tesla is that if you look at all of the press about all these electric cars that are being launched by the major manufacturers who's their baseline who's their comparison tesla i mean who would have ever a guy not a manufacturer a guy yeah who would have thought that 
you know, companies like BMW and, and everyone would be going, and it's XYZ to the Tesla. I mean, that car hasn't been around for a speck of what these other manufacturers absolutely have Absolutely correct, yeah, absolutely correct. Not only that, I do believe that Elon Musk uh, very kindly gave his, uh, his R&D away. Yes. He gave it all away. These manufacturers are using that stuff to make competitive cars because he was so ahead at the time. He was saying, look, you know, let's change the world together. Uh, good man, and I'm glad he did because it looks like uh, Jaguar have listened. Yeah. And they have listened big style because Jaguar have got one of the most – beautiful looking SUVs uh, the world has ever seen coming up and it's the I-Pace. That looks like I mean first of all just the Geneva show pictures what does it do for you Brad? Well let me let me take one step back. Jaguar took a huge leap in all of their styling. I mean yeah. everything looks incredible and when you see this I went okay I see a little bit of crossover because there's some yeah. You know, sedan styling, or as you'd call it, saloon styling, yeah. right? But it's it's sexy. It has that blunt Jaguar nose, you know, that, yeah. that grill. It's got big wheels, and it's got a really slim, nice look. I'd jump in that and drive it any day of the week. Of course you would. Anyone would. That's been designed by a friend of mine, Ian Callum, uh, who's head of design at Jaguar. Uh, super nice guy, Ian. And uh, and I know that Ian, because uh, I've been around him when he's designing, he's not thinking of now, Ian. He's thinking of 2025 when he draws, draws that. Yeah. He's thinking of what we're going to be driving in. Uh, don't design a car for today. Design a car for tomorrow is always the forward thinking uh, behind that. And that is a car that's going to look good on the streets and look good on the road in 10 years' time. It's always going to look good. You never want to buy a car that a year later it looks like it's from the past. Past, yes. Yeah. Yes, I hate that. Uh, and that's the, that's the trick with car design and car manufacturing. But, Mike, it's electric. Is it slow? I mean, is this thing going to keep up oh, with, God. you know, I mean, the other cars in my stable? Why don't you put your little AA batteries into it? <laughs> Right. Why don't you plug your little batteries into it and you think, oh, where's this going to get me? Just down the shops and back. No, let me give you some facts and figures. This has got a 240-mile range. 240 miles. Wow. Do you know most journeys taken by the average person is only 30 miles in a day. That's that's the absolute uh, average journey time for anyone during the course of a day is 30 miles. So 240-mile range, perfect. You could drive that car literally for a week without having to charge it. But more importantly, it's it's the it's the recharge on these. Oh, the recharge on these is is now they do these super fast chargers. Uh, they're starting to put them in, in petrol stations and gas stations across America, where you can pull in, go into a fast charging station, and by the time you go in, go to the toilets, restroom, get yourself a cup of coffee, and walk back out again, your car would have got eighty percent of its charge done within about fifteen twenty minutes. Now, how far are we driving today? I mean, what's I mean, what's the equivalent we're behind the well, wheel me, what are we, well, where are we where we're on our way to i'm going to take you for a nice little bit of lunch today because you're always moaning about your stomach Ooh. so we are going for a nice little bit of lunch and we're not going that far we are actually going no more than it's a it might stretch it in terms of uh um you know the average commute but it's about 15 miles away and then 15 miles back but i want to do a little bit of a detour so we'd still have 210 miles that we could go on the easy I easy i'll tell you what you could charge your you could charge your cell phone and I heard that this one, if it's zero, you just wipe it out, that with their fast charger, it'll go to 80% in 40 minutes. 40 minutes. That's 40 like, minutes. That's incredible, isn't my it? My iPhone takes that long. Yes. So does my, it's very yeah. true. Very true. Uh, now, let's talk about speed. So you've got an SUV at 0 to 60 miles an hour. 0 to 60. So you have to go. So it doesn't go to 60? It goes to 60 really quickly. Oh, you mean 0 to 60? No, it's 0. What's up with you, Americans? <laughs> Stop it. 0 to 60 or 0 to 60, if you like. It gets there in ready? 1, 2, 3, 4. Done. You're there. Four and a half seconds. Oh, my God. Four and a half seconds. Can you imagine strapping your kids into the back of that? Right then, kids. Dad's going to take you to school. Boo! Your little, your little kids in the back of the car, they are just going to be sucked into the boot of the car really quickly, aren't they? I mean, how fast do you need to go? The thing's got 512 pounds of torque. 512 pounds Instantaneous of torque. Instantaneous torque. It's like a switch. Do you know what that means? Do It means that if you get, I think, a row of them in a line, if you get, uh, let's say, 10, right? So if you've got 10 of them, you've got like 5,000... 
5,000 newton meters of torque going down onto the ground at the same time. If they all accelerated at the same time, the world would stop spinning and it'd go the other way. Well, I hope I hope somebody didn't get a hold of this idea of yours. That's what they would do. Yeah. You could spin the world backwards because. <laughs> but, they... but more importantly, you just said it. If you're taking the kids to school, they're leaning up and they're saying, "Hey, Dad, Dad, Dad!" You could just swap the throttle. They're back in the seats, and you just go. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. Just Listen, pin them back. The other thing as well is your kids are never going to be late, are they? In fact, they better not be. In fact, can you imagine right, with a car like this? Could you imagine ever turning up for a meeting? Late, because you haven't got a valid excuse, have you? I I can come up with one. Go on, what's your valid excuse? It sounds like it's going to be so much fun to drive that you might just take the long way. Oh, that's good though. <laughs> you should write adverts, Brad. You really should. Uh, All-wheel drive, uh, dual electric motors, uh, which is fantastic. And that's interesting about what I read on this is, you know, a lot of times they'll do a motor per wheel. This is all electric four-wheel drive. Yep. They have a motor per axle. So yep. one in the front, one in the rear. What does that give you, Mike? Uh, well, it gives you four-wheel drive. <laughs> and it gives you some better balance on the weight ratio. Yeah, plus I think you can send more power down to the rear than you can in the front. I think the computer mm -hmm. allows you to do that. Right, now let's talk about this car's big, massive, humongous selling point. And this is a big selling point. Other than the fact that, uh, and I urge you to do this uh, before I talk about the selling point, I urge you to go and have a look, go online and to look at Terry Grant. I pace flip. What is this? I haven't right, heard about right, this. You haven't even seen this, right? This is just... I'm going to show you... You won't believe this when I show you this after we do this podcast. Okay. Once we get... To, we shouldn't do it on the road. We're driving, so we can't do it on the road. But a friend of mine called Terry Grant, he's a stunt driver, he gets into an I pace And you remember the famous roll they did in yes. the James Bond film? Yeah, absolutely. Rolls one. Lands it. And he lands it? He lands it. It's the most audacious thing you've ever said. I can't believe he did it, to be honest with you. Why doesn't your car have Wi-Fi? I'd like to look at it right now on my phone. I, I, I've got, I drive a classic. You know, I this know. Old, this, old, this old Porsche of mine just doesn't do Well, it's not that bad. It's a 959 Porsche. Oh, right? that'd, be nice. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. I wish it was. In my head, it is. In my head, it's definitely a 959, but um, uh, the reality of it is not. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I urge you to do that. Now, let's talk about why this car is so spectacular. Now, you can see I'm getting excited already. Do you know why? Because if you was to buy this car here in America alone, you are going to get between seven and a half and ten thousand dollars tax break off the government just because you bought an I pace. In England, it's going to be about five thousand uh, pounds, so a similar figure. You're going to get that tax break off the government, so you are going to get rewarded for driving this car. Now, uh, the price of this car is phenomenal. It is. It it blew me away when I saw it. You ready? Sixty nine thousand five hundred bucks. That's a whole ten thousand dollars cheaper than the cheapest Tesla. Yep, the X or the S. That's amazing. That it is amazing. And you're going to get seven and a half to ten grand back off of the government. That is for nothing. That car. Now there is one little hook on that tax credit here in America, which is that it's. Each manufacturer only gets that on their first 200,000 electric vehicles. The so, first in the queue. So you got, and they're already taking orders. The car doesn't go into production until 2019. So you want to get in the queue right now because, you know, that, that's a tremendous savings. So me and you, we're doing something really important here. We're telling people out there that this is a good car. It's a great car. This is a car that's going to be worth its money. And we're telling people by the end of this podcast, they would have fulfilled their order book. They must do. If people listen to this, they're just going to rush out and buy one. Yeah, you're, you're right. They're going to go get one. And do you know that $10,000? they would buy a lot of gas. It would buy a lot of gas. But you won't need it for the I-Pace. <laughs> no, you won't need it. That's very true. Uh, what a great car. What a great car. And congratulations to uh, to Jaguar. Thank you, Jaguar, for uh, being forward thinking with that. Uh, fantastic. But they weren't the only people at Geneva showing off. Oh, by far. Strutting their stuff. All manufacturers, what happens is, okay, Geneva is where all the car designers, and I know most of them, they all put their peacock suits on. They all ran a show. Most of them have got uh, face furniture. They all grow these fancy... <laughs> they have. I'll tell you, they have. They all grow these fancy moustaches uh, because they want the cars to look like a reflection of themselves. So they grow a grill literally around their mouths. Um, 
And if you was to walk around Geneva, you'll see these uh, these car designers that I know and love, and they're all peacocking, they're all chest pumping, you know, and whoa, they're out there. So um, one of them, who must be, I think, uh, proud as punch with the car that he put on display and the way it's been received is the guy, I don't know his name, I do know his name, I've forgotten it, but it's the guy that is designing the concept cars for Porsche at the moment. There, I, I, and I know the one you're going to bring up because I bet you it's the same one that my eyes went to. I love it. Oh, my God. The Mission E Cross Turismo. If, if that car, and this is a concept car, if that car doesn't make it into production, then they are nutballs. Now, now, wait. You said it was a concept car. Yeah. But they said in big, bold letters, it's a design study. Yeah, but a design study is a concept, and a concept is a design study. But it's what cues they're going to take out of that and put into a road car. Because I'm gonna, just going to hold a picture of it in my hand so I can just see it. Because hey, it, you're driving. Uh, Come on. Uh, well, I'm going to hold a picture of it in your hand, Brad. Here, uh, I'll hold it up for you. There you go. Oh, look at that. I mean, that is just, that is just unbelievable. I think that is sensational. It's stroke Panamera, McCann, 911. It's every design cue that Paul should do brilliantly, but it's been wrapped up into this crossover package that just looks sensational. One of the things that make it for me is that it, it, it's those those really aggressive headlights that are so un like combined with that front fascia that just looks mean and like it's ready to go tear up, uh, you know, not only the roads, but some gravel roads. Right. It's also um, dual, uh, dual power as well. Let me tell you how quickly. Uh, so we spoke about the I-Pace. I mean, we don't know the price of this. No. This has got a Porsche price tag. Okay. So oh, this, sure it does. This ain't going to be the $69,000 that you're going to get the I-Pace for. I think you could put a one in front of that, probably. Yeah, maybe, right? yeah. But, but for your one that goes in front, we set the I-Pace uh, 0 to 60 in four and a half seconds. Uh, this <laughs> this Porsche ready, how quick do people want to go these days? 3.5 seconds. Whoa. 3.5 seconds to 60. I mean, that's supercar territory. Yeah. Proper supercar territory. Uh, ready? Top speed. Okay, does it have a two in front of it? It's got 250 kilometers an hour. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it will charge. In, in, so if you needed, we spoke, me and you, we spoke about uh, the necessity to do, th say, 30 miles. If you go 30 miles, which is your daily commute. Uh, so this can charge 70 miles. So it will do more. But if you wanted 70 miles, 70 miles in the tank, how quickly do you think I could get you 70 miles in the tank? Well, in electric, uh, gosh, my guess would be it's going to take at least 30 minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes? Four minutes. You can get 70 miles in the tank. <laughs> it's unbelievable. The and, technology of this and, is and, just crazy. And back to getting the kids to school, you would want to take the long way and probably go traverse across the lawn maybe to get there. This is one of those. So I'm going to say the saying again. This is a car that if you're taking your kids to school – they will get there before you left. Yes. Yeah, you're probably right. You are, I am right. Uh, what a car. I love it. I think the lines are great. I urge Porsche, um, and I know that they're listening. They are huge fans of Brad Fanshaw, my brewer. I know that they are listening right now, uh, and I urge them to put this into production because they will sell this by the bucket load. Look at what they did with the KN. You know, I urge them to maybe loan us each one to drive well uh, do you know they need reviewing exactly right? somebody these, has to drive all I mean, these cars need reviewing right whether it's the i-pace whether it's this uh i don't mind we'll drive anything i want to drive that kia stinger i've not driven that yet. Uh, yeah they i've seen that everyone going on about i'm going kia really seriously but everyone keeps going on about what a good car it is so uh yeah what a great great vehicle as uh i i noticed brad that you you said with this, uh, this is the perfect car. You said to me, away from uh, away from this podcast, go fast, get dirty, make dust. Yeah, that's what that car says to me. Now, what you, we just did, well, you penned it, I just said it, but what you just did is you just handed their PR machine a fantastic, fantastic T-shirt range that they're going to launch with this car. Go fast, get dirty, make dust with a puff of dust coming off the back of that T-shirt. They're going to do that, aren't they? Yeah, and so see, they should give us one to drive around they for should it. Do. You know, they yeah. Should do. We'll trade it. 
So, uh, so really good. I've, um, uh, well done, Porsche. Congratulations both to you and to Jaguar. Aston Martin, they also had, uh, let's go for another British manufacturer. Aston Martin had their DBX Super CUV. <gasps> Did you see that? Thing? I didn't. You did? Let me show you a picture of it. Cross utility um, vehicle? Uh, cross utility vehicle. Uh, this is the Aston Martin. Now, Aston Martin. Oh, wow. Uh, Aston Martin uh, have taken lots of design cues from everything they've done in the past, uh, whether it's the, um, uh, the, uh, the whatchamacallit, the DB9, DB11. Mm -hmm. They've taken all those design cues from the, the, the 007. The distinctive front nose. Yeah, the distinctive the... front nose. They've taken all of those uh, design cues and they've come up with a car that is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's, it's like the Vulcan. You know, it's like a Vulcan track car. Um this car actually is designed just around the corner from me at Gaydon. Uh, it's a challenge to the existing status quo in the high luxury GT segment. Uh, and that was explained by Andy Palmer. He's the uh, CEO. He's, I got that wrong. He's Dr. Andy Palmer. <laughs> They're always doctors, aren't they? I want to be a doctor of something. Um, but yeah, the concept GT uh, reflects beyond conventional thinking is what they're saying all-wheel drive um again so this is one of those gt crossovers do you think do you think people that work in porsche uh sort of just open up the factory doors or do you think they get around a cocktail table with some designers from aston martin and go guess what we're doing in two years time doing a gt crossover and then they all go oh well maybe we should be doing a gt crossover because they all seem to coincide it, it's it's doing. yeah that commonality of thinking because we saw the the panamera and then and then all of a sudden there was talk of a a Ferrari crossover what a Ferrari crossover are you nuts that'll never happen then we start seeing Lamborghini now Aston Martin yeah. everyone is seeing that segment and it's because people want performance they'll pay for high quality but they want it in a certain package that they can still you know haul the groceries haul the family and um haul ass <laughs> well talking <laughs> of hauling ass beautiful segue Lamborghini yes Urus it sounds like you've got a problem and you've gone to your doctors <laughs> and you've said, I've got a problem with my urus. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about hauling ass, it does sound uh, the Lamborghini urus. Urus. U-R-U-S. Uh, I can't even say it without hey, laughing. What does it mean? Well, it sounds like you've got a problem with your ass. Yeah, it, it does. Sounds like. uh, the Bentley have gone nice. They've just gone EXP9F uh, for Bentley with their one as well. Um but this looks fantastic. It's got Kerr system, uh, full kinetic recovery inside. Uh, so, uh, you know, under braking, when you're going down a hill, you're going to be recharging those batteries as well. Um, a drive-by-wire electronics uh, steering system, um, as well as an e-drive inside the car, so you'll be able to uh, do all of those functions. Uh, one of those, you know, those PR, the PR, I call it PR guff. You know, the PR guff that goes along with a, the launch of a car is the, is the, the puff of wind. Oh, the puffery. Yeah, the puffery. I call it guff, right? Uh, you'll like this one. So um, they have said that this car has got a... Ready? This is the guff. I want to know who comes up with this stuff. Sit, somebody must sit in a room. Go, oh, no, we should write that in the press release. It's really good. Cocooning ambience. Did, did was that was there something wrong with the car there? Was that a funny noise or cocooning? Oh, ambience. that's what you're saying is cocooning wow. ambience. Somebody actually comes up with that and uses that as a PR line. I mean, again, it sounds like a. a you, it sounds like something that a uh, mattress manufacturer might come up with. Correct. Yes, cocooning ambience. Uh, but for it, it, look for Aston Martin, fresh bold look. Uh, really like it. Fantastic. So yet again, uh, another British manufacturer, Jaguar, doing really well. Aston Martin doing really well. Uh, nod to Porsche and that and that wonderful E uh, Cross Turismo. But one manufacturer that's actually German owned, dare I say, it's German owned, uh, but British made, is uh, crossing all the way to the Far East, and that was an announcement. Also, at uh, okay, Porsche. wait a minute. We have a German owned, yeah, British made. Most car manufacturer, most car manufacturing in England is owned by somebody else. Chinese made. Right, okay, okay. Uh, so, so what, what you don't want, right? So, uh, let me. German owned company uh, uh, makes an iconic car in England. Okay. But it sells so well in the Far East that they've decided to move 
manufacturing, not all manufacturing, they've decided to make the car in the Far East. So if you want to go and buy uh, in 2019 a new Mini with the words Made in China on it. Really? Yes. You will get a Mini with the words Made in China written on it. Mini uh, and BMW have decided that they are going to move to mainland China. A joint venture, they're going to build that Mini electric car. Every car that Mini currently make in Oxford, England, uh, which is a fabulous plant, I've been around there three or four times, uh, is currently sent, all the cars that are in China at the moment are all sent from... Now, they're, they're not moving all their production over no, there. No, 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 no. Okay. No, just some of the production to satisfy that Eastern, uh, that Eastern world uh, demand for the car. Uh, but China is the fourth largest car market uh, in the world for Mini. So it's a very important market. For yeah, them. I would See, say so. So in two cents, all right, it, you can understand the logic in that. If you are making lots of cars in Oxford and you've got to imagine the shipping costs and the exportation to get that car to China is phenomenal. Plus the demands it's putting on, you know, uh, the, the globe in terms of its environmental output. It, the footprint of a Mini is tiny, but the environmental footprint is vast yeah. by the time it gets to China. So so you've got to imagine that it's a really good business sense to go, all right, I'll tell you what, why don't we just, you know, China's a big country. I think they've got a billion people over there or so. So why don't we just get them to make some? Uh, so they're making it. So if you wanted to get a, a Mini that's got stamped on it, made in China with a Union Jack roof, then you know, <laughs> you, you, you know you can get one in China in 2019. Maybe, maybe um, someday we'll, you know, remember back in like the 70s and the 80s, you'd see these uh, shots of Chinese downtown. It would just be thousands of people on bikes. Maybe Minnie's dreaming that someday it'll just be Minnie's just everywhere. Everywhere, yes. Uh, it's like um, like some kind of mad 60s film, isn't it? You know, where you wake <laughs> up in a dream, like a, um, you know, you wake up in this dream and the uh, Truman Show, and everyone's exactly the same, driving exactly the same car. Everyone would be a Mini. So Mini in China, electric is, Minis. Is there any American manufacturers making cars in China you know of? Yes. Now, one that doesn't do so well here any longer, mm -hmm. but is huge in China, is Buick. Buick, really? Buick. They make cars in China. And they were one of the very first to make that leap. And there's just something about the American story that, uh, that Buick spoke to the Chinese consumer. And Buicks do very well over there. Fantastic. Yeah. What is that? Have you ever been to China? I have. Yeah. Did, have you ever noticed the, uh, the copycat cars? Oh, <laughs> there's copycat everything there's copycat in China. Everything. I was in China and uh, and I was behind a BMW X5. A BMW X5 like? <laughs> in, but, but, the, 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 yes, I couldn't even say it. BMW X5 lookalike. Uh, now, uh, Frank St Stephenson, he designed the X5. Great car. Mm -hmm. uh, and he would have put his heart and soul into designing that. And it took... Um, uh, well, five minutes for the Chinese to go and buy one and to re back engineer it and to make their own copy of Sir, it. That's a copyright infringement. Uh, but yeah, um, I've seen those driving around in China. Um, and there's also a little copy mini. There's a mini there that's a copy of a mini, quite badly executed. Uh, there's a, a Peugeot, uh, which is a French manufacturer. There's one of those that's copied, just a, a standard hatchback. Uh, and there's all these kind of copycat cars out there. It's weird. But they have got this I, I, I'm, uh, land wind. That's it. Right. And I urge you, uh, when we get to our destination, once we're sitting at lunch, I'll show you. Uh, if you Google land wind, China land wind, and look at that. They have copied the Land Rover Evoque down to the, really down, yeah down to the to the valve cap. Land wind. I got to write this down because I've already got I pace flip. I'm yes, going to look at I the I pace flip. flip. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to land wind. Okay. Land wind. It's incredible. It's the most. I I just can't believe they got away with it. I mean, it's like seriously, you can't. It, you you just can't get away with it. But they have. They've got away with it. Well, well, Mike, you know I own a Swiss watch company. Yes. And when I go to China, because uh, on our lower price brand, we do have a few casings done over there. I always go to the market to see if there's any copies of our watches. And it's amazing. You can buy anything, anything there. Anything. anything. Yeah. I went into a uh, an Apple store. Okay, I went into an Apple store when I was in China. Uh, I was with a bunch of guys. We walked in. There was a new uh, – we were looking for one of the new 
things that were out, new iPhone or new gadget was out. And we walked into an Apple store, and uh, I picked up the cell phones, and I picked up the laptops, I was looking at all this stuff. Um, and then um, we discovered the whole thing was fake. It was a f- The whole store was whole fake? Store. It even looked, it had the genius people, the people in the blue t-shirt, the whole thing was fake. There were seven of them all across China, all fake, every single one of them. They got shut down. Well, you know, I was, I was, I turned on TV in my hotel when I was in Hong Kong and there was a show and I, I said, hey, this looks like Mike's show. And, but it was, it, it was, was me. It, but you were Chinese. I was in Chinese. Yes. They translate me in Chinese uh, everywhere. So that wasn't fake. It was just it was just dub. It was. Right now, I've got some questions came in for, uh, coming from people, which is good. Uh, these ones, I'm choosing uh, Facebook <laughs> this time. So, uh, Dieter Kurtz. Thank you very much, Dieter. Uh, Mike, what's the popularity of patina cars? How do you choose to restore a painted car or leave the patina? Now, this is a matter of taste. Uh, me... Right, you have to think of what a car looks like. If a car is original, it's a 1950s, 1960s, 1970s car that's got its original patina, and it's not too bad. It's you know, there's no holes in it. It's not got uh, anything that makes it dangerous. That car is only going to be original once. So if you can protect that originality, that is going to make that car tell a better story than one that's been restored. And let's face it, there's a billion restored cars out there, but there's very few original cars out there. Mike, would you say the difference between a patina, there's patinaed cars and there's just cars that are just darn worn out? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's some some people say to me, hey, Mark, I've got a car for you to, to buy. It. Uh, it's a brilliant car. Uh, you'll love it. It's got original patina, and you turn up, and it's like, no, it's not patina. That's worn out. Yeah. You, that just, you know, if Fred Flintstone has to, use the, has to use his shoes to drive that car down the road, you know that it's worn out. Uh, a shout-out to Oswaldo Adrian Perez. He said he's a big fan from Phoenix in Arizona. Uh, he wants me to buy a C6 Corvette. A C6? Yeah. Okay. C6 Corvette. Um, uh, somebody said Lenny, I love this name, Lenny Brassneck Higson. All right, you got a neck of brass. <laughs> All right, Brassneck Higson. He says, what's the one that got away? What's the car that got away? What's your car, Brad? What's the one that got away from Boy, you? Boy, it comes to mind right away. I was in high school. And uh, a guy called me and he goes, Brad, I know you uh, kind of, you know, deal in cars and, you know, parts and everything. And I said, yeah, what do you got? And I went over to his house and it was an all black Challenger with a 446 pack. And this car was a 1970. It was so nice. And I said, let me think about it. I went back the next day and it was gone. It had done got away. Now, that's break, heartbreaking, isn't it? Especially when the price on it, Mike? It's just incredible. Was $1,000. Yeah, but now I'm saying the price is now incredible. Oh, oh my gosh. For a real black-on-black black Challenger with a no. 446 pack. Oh, hold on. Let me just sit down and talk, think about that for a minute because that... I mean, I mean, look, we've all got cars that have got away, and everyone out there can can say, yeah, there's one that got away, but that's going to hurt. That's got to hurt, Brad. It does. There was one other one. Yeah. A Ferrari California. Oh, stop it. No, I'm serious. No, stop it. It, it was at Barrett Jackson. Yeah. It was 1980. Yeah. And it got away because I couldn't afford it back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? Two years ago, I was with uh, Chris Jacobs at Barrett Jackson. We were hosting it. And uh, me and Chris were, uh, it was Saturday night, and there was a um, uh, a Mauve 911 Targa uh, that was 1970. I'm trying to remember the years. The one with the oil cap on the on the side, 75. I was going to say like 75, 75 77, yeah, something like that. Yeah. The side. And there was one of those going through. Me and Chris stood around that car earlier on in the day, did a link about it. And we said, that's a, that's a hundred grand car. It was pristine. This car was pristine. And we going, that's a hundred grand car. So we had a little side bet between us, whether it was going to be, you know, $90,000 or $110,000. That's what we do, uh, thought. Um, Later on in the day, uh, we were working hard all through that Saturday. It got to uh, the the end of the TV show finished, but the auction is still carrying right. on. So me and Chris are taking our microphones off, and we're walking back uh, towards our hotel, back through uh, past where the auction is. And as we're walking back past where the auction is, it, the hammer had just gone down on it at 50000 bucks. Oh, wow. Half price. Yeah, Saturday night, 
Saturday night, everyone's going for dinner. Yeah, I was going to say, they've gone to dinner. Everyone. Yeah. yeah. That car went through, made 50,000 bucks. And I'm like, no! That was the one that got away. That was a car that got away. If I'd kept that car and had that car today, uh, I should have left a bit. Uh, and there's a little lesson. If you see something you like it and you think you're going away from the auction, leave a bid on it before you go. Yeah. Um, so that's good. Uh, so there's some nice questions. you like those? I, I love it when people send us questions because, I mean, they're, they're listening. They're interacting. And we can help them. And, and they're helping us. Some young lady called Charlotte has just uh, asked me, what's the difference between a saloon and a sedan? Oh, you're kidding me. We, we just talked about that earlier. A saloon is where you, uh, I mean, everybody knows. It's where, you know, after a hard week, you, you go there, you meet up with your uh, friends, and you uh, have a beer. And what's a sedan? Well, sedans, uh, you know, that's, that's something you drive around in, I guess. Right, so now let me reverse that. A saloon is a four-door car with a boot. That's what we say in England. That's a saloon car. No, no, no. It's it's the saloon doors. No, it's no, no, the no. flip floppy no, doors. No. Why do you get this wrong, you people? <laughs> right. So it's a saloon car. It's got four doors and a boot. That's a saloon. If it's a two door with a boot, it's still considered a coupe or coupe. A coupe. Uh, uh, if it's uh, a five door, so it's a so it's a it's a five door car like a Ford Fusion or Ford Mondeo with a hatchback. Or, with a hatchback, that's a five door hatchback or a three door hatchback. So a saloon is just a, a Crown Victoria. It's a saloon. Okay, that's a saloon. Okay, car. so you definitely one thing you definitely don't want to get mistaken is you do not want to be drinking in a saloon in that kind of saloon. Yeah. So and a sedan is something you sit on at home. It's your couch. Your sedan couch. That's what we... Really? A sedan yeah, couch? Yeah. See, there you go. See, stop mucking around with my uh, my uh, my language. And, and there again, you don't want to park your sedan on the front lawn. No, <laughs> Which right. it happens here sometimes. Right. So, the, the Fanshawe family are going to get into their family vehicle, and they are going to travel across America, and you're going to do it in what kind of vehicle? Oh, you're saying we've got kids, we've got luggage, yep. so we yeah, need a luggage. station wagon. Little you know, George. I mean, it's the quintessential American... American station wagon. Right, it's an estate car, Brad. That's called an estate car. No, no, an estate car is when someone dies and you go to their estate sale and you <laughs> buy the car. <laughs> okay, so there's the difference there. Uh, we say uh, estate car. We never use uh, the term station wagon uh, because it's it's the only time you Americans use the term wagon, as in a wagon, you know, with wheels on it, a cart and uh, towed by a horse. But I get why, because it's the wagons that brought you people to California, uh, and you would have had the family in it and the dog and their luggage. So that's why you call it a station wagon. I now, guess. why do you think you call it an estate car? Do you know the history on that? Uh, yeah, because it's more than a car. So it's uh, like the size of a, an estate Oh, is that what it is? Because, see, I was honestly wondering if it was, like, where, like, wealthier people, they had their country estates. and they, Because here in America, the early cars that the wealthy people that lived in the city and had weekend homes, they had town and country cars. That uh, uh, The wooden side cars that yeah, you see, yeah, yeah. the town and countries where they would they would load them up and they were only for one particular use, either to drive to their estate or while they were at their estate. Gotcha. So, so there you go. There's the difference again between this. But thank God today we are not in your station wagon. We're in my estate car as we just arrive at our destination. Uh, and lunch is my treat oh, today. Oh, good. Do I have to eat a salad again? Uh, yeah, we're both on the salad diet. You That's got me trimming having. down. But don't worry. We can we can have the salad diet, but we can, on the way back, I'll do a little drive-by in and out burger, and you can have a burger. <laughs> Go animal no, I'll just get the steak salad. <laughs> Go for the steak salad. Uh, fantastic. Well, listen, we've reached our destination on yet another eventful podcast, and we spoke about all kinds of things today. Um, again, you know, big round of applause to uh, the people at Geneva Motor Show. Uh, and I know it wasn't only the likes of Jaguar, Porsche, Mini, who had those announcements. Ferrari had their new car, uh, unfortunately named Pista. Uh, I don't know why they did that. Uh, it's like Ferrari. I always remember being at uh, Geneva when they launched the uh, La Ferrari. And I'm standing there going, hold on a minute, because I'm writing this up for magazines. And I'm going, so they've just called it Ferrari the Ferrari. Exactly. And I'm like, no, don't do that. Now they've just topped that by calling the car 
Pista, uh, which is another term for what happens on a Saturday night when me and Brad go out and get drunk. Uh, that's what we end up doing. Who is naming these cars? <laughs> Who is naming these cars? Uh, listen, we hope you enjoyed that. Um, it was really good fun to have you on the road with us. Uh, Brad, enjoyed the journey? I did. Always do. You're, you're a good driver. Thank you very much. Very cool. <laughs> uh, if you want to keep in touch with us, you can do online. Brad, what's the shout out? They can find us at Mike Brewer btw for behind the wheel dot com and on all social media mike brewer btw and of course you want to send those questions in send them into mike on his uh, social media yes. where uh, at uh, at mike brewer on twitter at mike brewer on instagram and wheeler dealer or at mike brewer on facebook uh and you can find me across all those platforms and we will try to get uh, to your answer uh, if we can't get to it we do apologize but we try to answer on social media uh it's always good fun to share the car with brad hope you enjoyed that uh we'll be back with another motoring podcast from behind the wheel with mike brewer very very soon right let's shut the door and let's get going can you turn the air conditioner on on the way back yeah okay cool This show brought to you in part by Bond Speed Wheels. Bond Speed Wheels, machined in America for cars, trucks, hot rods, and exotics. We make wheels for your lifestyle. Find us at bondspeedwheels.com. If you need to get in touch with me or Brad, you can do. Ask us any question you like about motoring issues or a motoring-related thing. If you've got something that you want to do to your car and you don't know how to do it, you want to sell your car, you want to advertise your car, uh, you want to buy a car and you need some advice, then please reach out to us. You can find us on Twitter at Mike Brewer BTW. See what we did there? Genius. Is that for behind the wheel? It is. There you go. Wow. How did you come up with that? It's so good, isn't it? And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. This has been a Bond Speed Media production from Circle B Studios. If you like this show, also listen to Shift and Steer, Man Seeks Adventure, and Dixon's Wild Ride. You can subscribe to them on iTunes or visit their websites. If you'd like to reach Bond Speed Media, you can do so at bondspeedmedia at gmail.com.